So here I have the quilt layered. I've got a backing fabric, my cotton batting, Quilter's Dream Request, 100% cotton batting, and I have my quilt top laid on top. And then what I do, I'm gonna move over here. And then what I do is I get my iron with some steam in it, and I start in the middle, and I'm going to iron, pushing the wrinkles out and warming up my quilt. And if you'll see, I'm doing this on my big cutting table. I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm kind of heating up the top layer, plus smoothing out any bumps or wrinkles. Whoops! And did you see how I just lifted that up with my hot iron? So, thank God it didn't. I'm going to hit it again with some steam. Now, every day you start to work on your quilt, you're gonna get out your iron and you're gonna steam it and get it ready for quilting. Okay, not all fusible web, you can iron it every day. Okay, so overnight it kind of gets cold. We wanna warm it up because when the fusible is warm, it's easier to sew through. Tip number one. You may wanna write these ones down. Okay, we're gonna pin baste. And I've got an assortment of safety pins. I like kind of a medium size safety pin, about like this. I don't want them to get too small. And I kind of like the ones, I don't know if you can see this right here, they kind of have a little curve in the middle. We aren't going to use a ton of the safety pins, but what I do first is I am going to start in the middle and I'm going to pin right here up next to one of the flowers in the background fabric. Okay, and I'm going to pin it. Then I'm going to kind of spread out with my hands. I'm going to go out maybe eight inches and I'm going to pin another one from that main safety pin out. And I'm going to come over here maybe a little bit farther. Maybe right in here. And I'm going to pin again. Okay. And every once in a while I give a little tug to the backing. And now I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna pin maybe eight inches around. I'm not gonna do um, like you're gonna do hand quilting where if you don't know about hand quilting, you have to pin like, you know, within two inches of each other. Because this basting is not gonna be the permanent basting. I'm gonna show you how we do a, um, a basting on the sewing machine that I call stitch in the ditch. And we're gonna remove all these pins. Okay, we're gonna remove all these pins. So it's always easier to pin through the background, but I need to make sure, like over here, I need to make sure that that is smooth. Pick it up and pin it. Okay, now this technique you wouldn't do on a big traditional quilt. Okay, this is for art quilts. This is for a fusible art quilt, not for your um, big quilt, okay? And one of the things I always have to remind myself is you wanna make sure you do, is when you get close to the edge, like right here or right up here, let's show you right up here, because I have the batting and I have the backing fabric, um, I wanna pin all the way up to the top here. And then sometimes if I have extra fabric, I'll fold it over the batting and I'll pin again. Okay, this is so that this fabric, while you're sewing, doesn't flip under, and next thing you know on the back of your quilt, you've sewed that edge to the back of your quilt. Now, how do I know that? Because I have done that more than once. So I'm gonna take this. Another thing is, is you could put wonder clips all along here to hold that too, however you wanna do it. But the first thing you wanna do is make sure you've got your fabric, your fabric uh, pinned and then go back and you can kind of cover up your batting, if that makes sense, I hope. So here we go. I cannot wait to stitch this, it's gonna be, and I can't wait to show you this, because I hopefully this will answer all the questions, how does she do that? You know, and people are always coming up with new techniques, that's why we take classes, right? 
because we're always learning new stuff. So I'm going to continue pin basting my quilt and then we'll take it over to the sewing machine and get it ready for quilting. So we're going to talk about thread and you can use any kind of thread that you want, but I fell in love with sulky rayon thread and I didn't know that people were having a hard time with it. And so I just figured out how to use it and that's what I've been using. And the reason why I like it is it's shiny and I like shiny things. <laughs> I like really shiny things, but I like the shine. It adds another little sparkle to the quilt and you can see the thread more. Now see, I want our thread to show. So let's talk about what renegade means. Renegade thread play is what we're doing here. And I'm breaking all the rules I was taught to do traditional quilting. It just didn't work on this type of big chunky fabric. See all these big chunky fabrics? The little tiny delicate thread and stitches just disappeared and it kept this chunky look. It didn't make a nice smooth um, blending quilt. So I had to invent something and I played around and I figured out that to use this sulky rayon thread. Now, I started out using 30 weight sulky thread and sulky does not make the 30 weight anymore. 30 weight is a thicker thread. Like 12 weight would be really thick. 30 weight was a nice thick thread. This is 40 weight. Okay, so you can see how the numbers get smaller, the thread gets smaller. No wait, the numbers get bit anyways. You know what I mean. So let's talk about the kind of backing fabric you're gonna put on here. I'm putting black, I've always used black, but maybe you wanna use something else. See, black is gonna, I'm putting the same color thread in the top of the machine and in the bobbin. And then the bobbin thread shows up on the black, okay? And then it gives me, like I'll bring over my, this is my iris quilt. And then you can kind of see I have a thread painting out of thread on the back of my quilt. All my quilts have this. Can you see that? So you have to decide if you want to do this. There's the front of my iris quilt. I have fabric packs for this also. And then I use the same color thread in the bobbin. So I'm going to do that with the dogwood um, so that you can see. So I'm putting black on the back and then I'll have a thread painting on the back. I just like to do that. Plus it's nice because you got the same weight thread in the bobbin and in the top. And so you have an equal thread tension. If you don't want to do that and you want to put, let's say, and I've done this too, you could put a busy backing on the back of your quilt and pick one color that you want to use because you can't really see the stitching there, can you? And I can kind of zoom in here and get up close. And you still, on a busy print like this, you still really can't see that thread. Even this, and just put uh, the purple in the bobbin. Just one color thread in the bobbin, and then on top you'd be changing uh, your thread colors. Okay, so that could, that could work. Sometimes when I first started doing it, I would put a busy backing fabric on the back and I would just deal with what it looked like on the top. I couldn't handle what was going on on the back because I was too scared. Okay, but I'm going to show you how to be braver. So um, you can choose either a solid color or a wild print and just wind like I would wind about five yellow bobbins and just keep one color in. And the best kind of thread is to use 50 Aurifil cotton. Okay, Aurifil, if you're gonna use the sulky thread on top of your machine, Aurifil cotton in the bobbin works really good with this thread. This is slippery, slippery thread. And what we need is some kind of, um, the bobbin needs to have a little nub. Cotton thread is matte and it has a little nub and it can grab the slippery thread and make a nice even stitch. Okay, you don't want to use a slippery thread in the bobbin. You want to use something like Aurifil. And Aurifil, I use Aurifil for all my traditional quilting and piecing. I mean, it's just a really good thread. 
okay? But it goes really good with the sulky if you want to do the orophyll in the bobbin and the sulky on top with a busy backing fabric on the back of your quilt. Otherwise, we're going to do what I do, which is same thread in the top as in the bobbin. Like, well, let me see if I haven't even have a green bobbin. Let me show you my bobbins. This is, <coughs> I found this bobbin case, which I like because it holds all my Bernina big bobbins. These bobbins on my Bernina, um, the 7 series all have these big, I think the 8 series too. These big giant bobbins. They hold a lot of thread. And as you can see, I have a lot of bobbins because I'm going to be changing my bobbins a lot. Every time I change a color, I'll wind a new bobbin. Or I'll use something that's kind of close. Well, that's not close. Maybe this. Yeah, that's probably what I would do. So that's how I... That's how... I do my bobbins. So I, of course, had to buy more bobbins because all mine melt in a fire. <laughs> so I'm always buying stuff. But uh, hey, a girl can never have too many bobbins or too much thread. Okay, so I've had to also go and start replacing all my thread. So here's my, my greens right now. And when I'm doing a quilt like this, I get two of the same color. Okay, I find two of these little spools of the same color really help me out when I'm doing a big quilt. Now on this quilt, I think one spool of each color will be great. So what do we need? We need some beiges. Let's see, we need, um, we need some lime green. We need a darker green, you know, for in there. We definitely are gonna need white. Um, so I always go through my quilt and see what colors am I going to need. Well, I'm going to need white. There's lavender over here. I'm going to use lavender. And then I can bring in more lavender. You know, I can bring in more lavender over here. I'm going to need some pinks. Like I need a medium pink for here. I'm going to need a darker pink. And I'm going to need a pale pink. Um, there's some blues in here, so I have this blue, and it's kind of a blue-gray, so it can also be used for the grays. I have some, um, like right up here, we've got a limey green. Whoops, I think this is the color I'm using on that. We've got brown for the stem. I have some um, greens. Let me see. We have a darker beige. What else do we have here? I'm thinking that's pretty good so far. Oh, there's pale yellow. We use the pale yellow. So as you see, you need like a coloring box full of threads. And then you're gonna need a color for the background. Um, and on this one, I think I'm probably gonna use black. So, so far that's what I have. Now I also have some thread packs on my website that I've already put together like this, if you care about that. But you can just go and uh, find Sulky. I think they have it at Joann's. I'm not sure if they still, <laughs> are they open even? But anyways, that's my collection of thread to get started. And as you get going, you may change your mind. You may want more. Um, you may want to use like a light color to soften something down, but I'm thinking we've got a good collection here. So that's my rayon thread that I'm going to use. So here's some of my tools that I use. And yes, I use the seam ripper a lot. I use these, our Karen K. Buckley um, thread snips. They have a curved tip, but they are super sharp, and they really go down and clip that. I got these great tweezers from Heidi Profetti, and she does the digital um, die cut quilts that look kind of like a stained glass and she uses these little tiny snips and as you can see those we took out a, um, a nice thorn out of my son's foot the other day with these they work great you're gonna need a free motion foot for your sewing machine okay this is my free motion foot there's a couple different ones for the Bernina but this is what I'm using um, so you find out what is your free motion foot you're gonna need 
gloves, quilting gloves. A friend gave me these. And because it's hot here in Bakersfield, and putting on the gloves and taking them off each time I rethread a new color, all the threads get stuck on these little bumps. So what I've been using, I've gone back to using Neutrogena Extra Dry Hand Cream. It has a little tackiness to it, and it works out great. I was using, uh, here, Lickety Grip. So you take this, you put it on your hands, you rub some of it in, and it gives kind of a tacky feel, just like the hand cream does. But I can't find this anymore. Nobody can find this anymore, so we don't know what's happening. So we're going to go back to what Diane Gadinsky always used to use. She did fine free motion quilting. Beautiful. Neutrogena Extra Dry Hand Cream. Just keep it by the side of your machine in your basket. Now, another really important tool that you do need is this. Sewer's Aid is made for rayon thread. Your rayon thread will not break if you're using Sewer's Aid on it. So sewer's Aid lubricates um, the thread, and as it goes through your sewing machine, because this is very fragile thread here, you know, now watch this, this thread can break just like that. And so it's fragile. <clears throat> and if there is a burr or a little metal or plastic char sticking out, the thread will get caught on it and then it'll start shredding on your needle. So I always coat my thread after I wind my bobbin. So I wind my bobbin first and then I will coat my thread. Now I'll show you how I, I coat my thread like this. I'm going to put a line of the stuff right here. Hopefully you can see that. I'm going to turn it over a third, put another line across it. And there you go. And I put a little extra up by the tip because sometimes when they're winding these spools on here, it gets a little tight right around there. So then I squeeze it in. Then I put it on my sewing machine and I thread it. Now, why my fingers have this residue on, I go over and I wipe it on my needle. And then I have some of that, some of this smooth lubricant on my needle also. And it helps with the buildup of the sticky because you will get buildup of sticky. There's a right way to have sticky on your needle, meaning you've been sewing all day and your needle got hot and it's attracting the um, fusible web to the needle. Or if you start sewing right away and you get sticky on your needle, that means you have not pressed with hot steam all your layers together and there's some layer in there that is not adhering to the other layer. And so you just take it out and go repress this, okay? Because it loves the hot steam. And that's how you get goo off your needles. You use sewer's needles. And the kind of needles I use are a jeans denim or I use a top stitch needle. These are some chrome top stitch needles. I use an 8012 is the size. There we go. 8012 or a 9014. Okay, like here's some jean denims. This is a 9014 and an 8012. When I start a project, I buy two packages of needles, whatever needle I'm going to use. Okay, I buy two packages per quilt. Just get used to it because you're using rayon thread and rayon thread has to have clean needles to work prop properly. When you are working with a needle for hours, there's a coating inside the eye of the needle. Okay. And as you're sewing with that thread going through here really fast, it wears off the coating that's inside the eye of the needle. And there could be a little burr here or a little burr here. And as the thread is going through, it starts to shred, shred up on your needle. That probably means you need a new needle. Now, if you were sewing with cotton or polyester thread, you could be sewing for days with that same needle. But when you are using a delicate embroidery thread like rayon, you need to change your needle. 
So every day I change my needle, like every six hours I would change my needle, or if the thread is shredding up on my needle, that's a good clue I need a new needle. Okay, so if you always have two packs to get started, you will eliminate one of the hassles of sewing with rayon thread. People have told me, doesn't it melt? No, it does not melt. Doesn't the color run? No, the color doesn't run. The the important thing is that you don't sew the crotch of your jeans with this and then bend over because it isn't going to hold them, if you know what I mean, okay? So make sure because it's so delicate. You know, it's not for sewing up something. It's for making beautiful stitches and embroidery and um, thread play. So I'm going to, those are some of my tips and tricks and some of my new tools that I love, these snips. I have some of these on my website. You can go to Heidi um, Profetti's website and get these cool tweezers. Oh my gosh, I love these. But really, and I have Sewer's Aid on my website too. You can get that at any quilt, quilt shop. And then make sure you got your um, free motion foot because we're going to do free motion renegade thread play right about now. Okay, I want to show you a little tool I use. Um, this is my iPad Pro and my little pin here. And what I've done here is I've taken a picture of my quilt and I've brought it up in my Adobe Sketch program. And then I have pushed uh, the red uh, line and I've drawn around where I'm going to do my stitch in the ditch. A lot of times I use this tool to figure out how my thread's going to go. It really does help. Um, but this is my basting technique. The pins are not enough. I need to baste all three layers together with the sewing machine. And um, so I'm going to show you right now the path to take. You're going to use, on mine, I'm going to use the background color. I'm going to use uh, my black thread. And I'm going to stitch right along the edge of the petal. And let's go on in here. I'm going to stitch right along the edge of the petal. Not on the petal on the edge, on the outside edge. Now when I draw this, you're gonna see this, I, I my hand's kinda of shaky, okay? But I call it stitch in the ditch because later on when I do all my thread, all my thread, you're gonna see that those stitches that I first put in to base, my basting stitches, disappear. They slide under as the quilt shrinks with all the thread, they slide underneath the petal and if your stitches were wonky, around that stitch in the ditch, no one will ever see it. But it held securely all three layers of my quilt while I was sketching and coloring and drawing with my thread. So I'll show you my drawing okay. lines now. And my first place I'm gonna start is probably right up here. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go right along the edge of this flower. Now we're not gonna do everything in the and then I'm going to go all the way around here. I'm just going to do this fast. So you can, I'm going to go around the outside of this. This is with the stitch in the ditch. I'm not going to do that leaf. And then I'm going to go around the outside. Now I'm on the background. I'll be stitching on the background fabric. And I'm having trouble. Now when I get to this petal right here, I'm not going to go over. I'm just going to go down like this. And then I'm going to go around, okay? This is hard to draw. I'm gonna go just around this flower. When I get up to this leaf, I'm gonna go around the leaf and then I'm gonna come around. Now I'm, I'm on the background again. And then I'm gonna go all the way around, all the way around. Now, back to where I started. That, where that red line is, that's enough of basting where I can take out my pins all along the way. Now. My three layers are held together with thread. So I can start going in here and sketching back and forth, back and forth, back and forth without the fabric batting or the quilt top moving. Okay, we do our leaves and our stems last, last and by then the whole quilt will be pretty stable. But I found doing the stitch and ditch just holds everything a lot more stable. So now I can pick any place I want to start. I used to, in the olden days, I'd start in the middle of my quilt and I would work out. 
But now I want to be able to, if I want to do yellow over here, and I want to hop over and do some yellow over here, if I want to do the all the pink at the same time, I can hop around, or I can just focus on one petal at a time. So it's up to you. But when I do this basting, this with, um, and I'm going to show you it live, it just really holds all three layers together so I can color and paint with my thread any place I want. Before we get started, I just wanted to show you one more thing about needles, okay? It's really important to look at what the name is of the needle and the size. Both matter. A top stitch needle is what I'm using. This needle was designed to go through thick, heavy fabric. It was designed to go through men's wool suiting. And then they would top stitch through all these layers of wool with a big thick buckram interfacing inside. And so they had to have a needle that wouldn't break the thread, so it has a big eye. And it's a tough needle and it's designed to go through thick and heavy fabrics with a delicate thread. And that's what we're doing. We're going through thick fusible so it's really important to have the name. And so it can be a top stitch needle or it can be a jeans denim. And what is jeans denim needles used for? You got it, jeans denim. Now, my machine does really good on the size right here, down here. It says 8012. And my machine kind of likes that. Some machines do not like 8012 and they need a 9014. So if your machine is acting up, skipping a lot of stitches is the clue. Or you've been sewing and then all of a sudden it's hopping and skipping stitches. You may want to go to a top stitch or jeans denim 9014. You need the name and the number. You can't just say, oh, I've got an embroidery 90. No, that is not what you're doing. We're going through thick fabric. This was designed to go through thick fabric. Okay, so there you go. And thank you, Libby Lehman, for explaining those things to me. Then we're ready to go. I'm going to thread it with some black thread here uh, in the bobbin. And on top, I'm going to keep these guys over to the side. Now, I wanted to, you may be asking, what is this sheet right here on my, this is called Supreme Slider. I think it says it right here, Supreme Slider. And this covers up all this rough stuff right here. Now I have my feed dogs are down. I push my button. These are the feed dogs right there. And I push my feed dogs down. And then this covers up all this metal area. Now this metal, if you put your finger across there, it's sharp. And as you work with rayon thread, it'll start fraying all the thread on the back as it goes past those metal places. Plus, this is very slippery. So your, your, your um, quilt will glide very nicely on top of it. I mostly use it because of that um, rough, sharp edges right here. It'll fray and then you'll look on the back of your quilt and you've got all this fraying of your threads. Okay, so here we go. And you go down. Okay, now you're probably noticing she's not using black thread like she said she was. Well, I figured out you can't see it. You know, you aren't gonna be able to see what I'm doing. So I'm putting on this green thread to go around and I'm putting on my, my hand cream to get it, get my fingers tacky. And we're going to start free motion. Now, I brought both my threads, if you'll notice. And you also need to have it in uh, your needle in the down position. And then I'm going to roll up my quilt so I have a little bit of a control. And here we go. I've got both threads at the top. And I'm going to start. Now, I want you to see that my needle, I'm going to go slow so you can see, my needle is going along the edge of that white petal. You see how I'm doing this? It's not on the white petal. It's just up next to it now. Can you see that? Let's try it right here too. 
Now when you get scared, you stop. Do you know how to stop your machine? You lift your foot off the pedal. I know, it took me a while to figure that one out. So here I'm coming down here. Anytime anything kind of lifts up, just go slow. Yes, I accidentally went on that pedal, but I'm trying to run my needle right up against the edge of the fabric. You don't have to go fast. Okay. Turn your work so it's comfortable. And if you'll notice how my hands are, my hands are like this. I'm, I'm just focusing what's in my hands, like it's an embroidery hook. Just stop and just. Now, this wants to lift up again. Okay, so I'm going to go over and I'm going to iron this. I'm going to iron this, okay, so that it'll stay down. When you have the needle down position when you stop, do you see it's like your third finger? It's holding, it's holding everything in place. constantly with the quilt because we don't have a big you know space here you got to scrunch your quilt up okay my thread just broke there and let's think about why it broke well I figured out why it broke when you are pushing and pulling in free motion, you're tugging on the thread and that pulling causes the thread to stretch and pop and break. So that's why you need to lower your thread tension. My thread tension is up on 5.25 and it needs to be down to about a 3.5. So I'm going to re-thread and start over where it broke. You don't have to watch me do that.
going to show you, and I'll show you a couple times, how I end my threads. So, so there's no knots on the back. Um, so I'm lifting up my needle to the top position, and then I'm going to bring it towards me, loosen it, and then I give a little tug. Do you see how, I hope you can see that, how that little green bobbin, it's turquoise thread, pops up, then I get in here with my little snips. Okay, I'm pulling up the bobbin's thread so you can kind of see that it's a different color, but you don't have to pull it up at all like that. You take the curved tip snips and you press them down on the body of the flower, of the flower, of your quilt, and I'm snipping the bobbin thread and the top thread at the same time. Now there's no tails on the back of my quilt, and I don't have, I don't do a knot, but I do go and press this now, and the heat reactivates the glue in the fusible web, and then the um, thread is permanently embedded in your quilt. So I'm over and I'll show here. you how to do that. Step back a little bit. I'm at my ironing board after I did the stitch in the ditch, and I'm sitting and I am steaming the heck out of it. And press it down again using steam, kind of the middle of the flower, and then press out. Okay, so now let's look at what our stitch in the ditch looks like. Okay, here's our stitch in the ditch. Can you see? Let's go over here like this. Let's see if we can see it. So that outside turquoise thread is my stitch in the ditch. We have no folds in our quilt. And now I'm ready to start stitching wherever I want in the middle of my quilt. But let's look up close. And already you can see those lines will disappear. Nobody will even notice. And I wasn't very straight. But that is a perfect stitch in the ditch. I think you can do that. Okay, first assignment, stitch in the ditch. Okay, what I've done is I have wound a light blue thread. I have then put um, sewer's eight on my thread. I've got the right needle in, a top stitch, 80-12, and I'm going to start stitching. I put the stuff on my hands so they're nice and kind of tacky, and I'm going to start on this blue little wedge right here. The key is you're going to always follow these little shapes, how they curve, how they move. That's what you're going to do, and the, and the motion is going up and down. It's really hard and complicated, <laughs> but you have to do it free motion. There's the trick. Oh, we have to set our thread tension. I have to loosen it to a lower number. Manufacturer has set it for regular sewing at five or four, depending on what your machine is. To do free motion, you have to loosen the thread tension, meaning I have to go down to a four, a three, a two. Sometimes some machines, you go to a one and a zero. I've done that one before. This is your thread tension, your top thread tension disc. So I'm gonna lower mine down to 350. Let's see how that works. I'm going to go out a little bit and I'm going to clip my threads. Now the thread is coming out a little bit darker because I've put the mineral oil, or not mineral oil, whatever it is, sewer's aid on the thread. That all evaporates, so don't panic because you can kind of see my threads a little bit. And you'll notice I sewed off the edge of that piece. I'm going to go right here. I'm going to sew off the edge of that piece.
Now I'm going to go over to this blue piece over here and I'm going to do what I call traveling. I lift up my presser foot so that there's no pressure on my thread. I raise my needle and I walk over and I'm going over. I know I won't be driving over these threads and I can clip them later. Okay, now one thing I want to show you is if you know how to do your um, speed control, it's really important. And let, let me show you my speed control. We're going to go up here. There we go. This is my speed control button right there. And if you'll notice, I have it closer to the slow. Okay, and I can push my foot all the way down on the pedal and it'll stay at a constant speed. Then I just adapt my hands to go with that speed. So I can get very regulated um, stitches by doing that. Let's get back in here. I may come back and add more. Um, I just wanted you to see how I drive off the lines of the pieces. Okay, I find it softens the chunky fabric. And you don't really know where the chunky fabric began or ended because you drove off the edge. So here's how I color with thread. The blue piece starts right in here. Okay, but I'm going to start right over here because maybe there's a little shadow there. And so I call this sketching. Okay, and I'll do the same thing with the pink and the lavenders will go up and down and that'll give a nice little highlight. Now I'm going to put on um, some yellow and I'm going to do this area and a couple other yellows but I want to show you a little trick I'm going to take off before I put this on I always take off oops you can't see that okay I always take off this sticky this sticky label okay what happens when you take this with this label and you just pop it on your uh, spool your sewing machine spool up there, the sticky starts building up and then it causes your thread not to smooth 
smoothly roll onto that spool holder because of all the buildup of this sticky goo. So the best thing to do is take it off and then put it so on So I had to wind a new holder. bobbin because I'm going to do yellow. And I moved my quilt out of the way. I rolled this up. my, And then I can go and get in easily, get into my uh, bobbin case, change my bobbin. Put it back in. Come on. There. And then I roll that back down. That pink on the Super uh, Supreme slider keeps it in place right there. Now I'm ready to thread my and I'm going to put a little bit of this on my finger and I'm going to rub it on my needle. So it'll slide through the fusible web also. Let's start right here. Come on. There we go. Now my goal is to keep them evenly spaced. Doesn't always happen, but that's my goal. Okay, let's go over here. I'm going to lift up.
here I can see that little bobbin loop and so I pinched it and I have clipped it right at that thread. You can do the same with these guys sometimes. Get right there that bobbin thread. Here's this one, we've got that one, and this one. And then what I do, so they won't come out, is I'm going to press all of these with my hot iron. I'm gonna bring the iron right over to here. I can go any place else on the quilt I want. Do I want to do more yellow thread? Maybe I do. I'm going to move it all the way over here. And let's do this yellow thread. So let me show you how we're going to um, kind of blend these colors together. In fact, I'm going to turn over to here so you can see. When I'm do going to do my veining that's going to come out and my shading, I'm kind of looking at how are these veins going because they would normally continue up into here. So we're going to draw that so the viewer thinks, you know, we're doing that. So. And then I'm going to blend and shade over into uh, this light yellow. So here's how you do it. You go out. Oops. Got to adjust your quilt all the time. And you're going to go off of the edge of this beige. Now, once I get going, I don't want to have all these little threads. Sometimes I get a little excited and I don't want to clip them, but 
clip them, trust me, because then you're about to have a mistake. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come off out into the yellow, and then I'm going to go back up. Can you see that? Because this piece is curving this way, so I'm curving it that way. So now I'm going to come over here, and I've got to come over here, and I'm going to do some little. And now I'm curving the other way, because over here, it's curving the other way. So somewhere in between there and there, you have to transition over to that other that other angle. Okay. Whoop. If you saw how I'm sitting here with a camera lighting and that I could even do this is amazing. <laughs> but we're getting it done. We're getting it done. Okay, so here we go. Now I'm coming up to the yellow. And so I'm gonna come out here and I'm gonna do a little shading, kind of following how my shading went with um, the yellow. Now I can always come back and go over. Remember this is, we're coloring with threads so I can always go in and shade. And do you see how that softens that chunky fabric when you go over? It changes the shape of it. I probably should be talking here while I'm doing this. And when I wanna go back, I'm just gonna go around over like a stitch in the ditch along the center piece. And then come over and maybe I want to shade in a little bit more. I'm going all the way up to here. And then let's go over to the other side. Because it doesn't matter if you start with the dark and then go into the light, or you start with the light and blend into the dark. It doesn't matter. What matters is continuing these shapes. So I'm going to come over to here, and there we go. When I say shapes, I meant the curve, curvature of how the veins are in the flower. And sometimes I leave gaps like this, and then I'll, it's kind of hint lines, and I'll come back and I'll fill in in that area. So like here, I'm doing like a little hint line, and we know this guy goes down like this. And then over here, you may go like this. So now I've got to look over, we're changing to a different petal over here. Do you see how this is a different petal? So now I'm gonna to have to go kind of curving a different way. And then it changes direction again. So now I've made kind of some hint lines. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to color. That's looking pretty good. Do you get the idea? We always go up closer. You see how it's wider here and they're closer up here, okay? Because that's how the shapes go. It's tighter up here and then it goes wider out here. So you wanna keep that. You always wanna keep kind of a curve going, but that's how you're gonna do the centers or the shadows in the middle of the, the flower Here's in the center. Here's the blue and yellow that I did. And I'm going to go in and I'll do the purples. And you're following the way the shapes move. When I go in and do this brown, I'm going to bring it on out here. I'm going to take some of this lavender and I'll go up into that yellow and into that blue. Okay, to soften that. And I may just draw and put a little lavender right in here also. It'll have a different a value over here because it's not on the lavender peats. It's kind of like where I did over here. You see where I was doing the yellow here. And then I just went in and did a little sketching in yellow here just to give it a shadow where there was no piece of fabric. 
So I'm going to continue in this manner all over the quilt. And that's what I want you to do. Make sure you're following your shapes. Now on the kit, this was a weird color, this color G. And there was no thread that I could find to go with it except for a yellow. And it looks really good. It's a, it's a different color yellow. It's not in the thread pack today, but it will be in the thread pack tomorrow. Or you can buy it separately from me. Just email me and I'll have that spool here. So our next class is going to be how to do the center, how to do the stem, how to do leaves, and how do we do our background. Okay, so that's your assignment is to finish your quilt going back and forth, changing your thread, following the shapes. Now, here's what I want you to know. I'll turn this this way. If you are afraid and you are timid, the best way to get good at doing this is practice. And I have the perfect class for you at, um, you can see it right here, iQuilt.com. And it's called Renegade Thread Play. And you make a sample piece out of black fabric and then you follow along with me doing exercises learning to do a leaf, learning to do an, a long iris leaf, which makes you go up and back and up and back. So if you want to get a little more practice before you attack your um, flowers, the more time you spend behind your sewing machine, the better you get. That's the only way you get good. So go ahead and start working on your quilt. And then I will be back next week with leaves and centers and backgrounds. I think that's enough for you for right now. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me. Send me any questions to Melinda Beulah at Comcast.net if you have any questions. And um, there's that class if you want to do that class. So thank you very much for your patience. See you next time.